Thanks for coming in, everybody. This is uh, Ambassador Doug Luth, the most recent uh, uh, U.S. Ambassador to NATO. Uh, he would have loved to attend, but um, I think slipped a disc in his back and couldn't get on the plane, so he's, he's uh, uh, talking to us from his home in Washington. Uh, so without further ado, I will um, put the microphone down. To okay. How are, how's it sound now? Good. Yeah, we're clear. Okay, we should probably stop right here uh, and consider this uh, success. Uh, look, uh, thanks, uh, first of all, for gathering today. Uh, I have to apologize. Uh, I'm in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Could not make the trip to uh, DEF CON this year, although I was very much looking forward to it. Uh, so uh, this has to pass for uh, my opportunity uh, to share some time with you. Uh, Jake mentioned that I most recently served as uh, U.S. Ambassador to NATO in Brussels for the last three and a half years. But actually, I've spent my entire adult life in the national security arena. I served in Europe as an Army officer during the Cold War, uh, in the Balkans uh, in the mid-1990s, uh, in the Middle East and South Asia since 9-11. Uh, uh, I've served in the Pentagon, in the White House, and most recently at NATO headquarters. In short, I've studied national security issues my entire life, beginning at West Point, uh, through my Army career, my time at the White House, and uh, with a degree at Harvard. So you might ask, why, why am I piped in to DEF CON? What am I doing talking to you, uh, this audience of cybersecurity uh, experts? Uh, I have really just one simple main point, and that is that last year's attacks on the American voting process are as serious a threat to our democracy as any I have seen in over 40 years. The attacks last year may prove to be more serious than any physical attack at the core of our nation. Now, physical attacks obviously incur loss of life, damage to materiel, and those losses are tragic. But ultimately, America is a rich, strong country. We can recover from those attacks. We're resilient. However, if we were to lose confidence in the security of our voting process, the voting process, this most fundamental link between the American citizen and his and her government, if we lost confidence in that, the damage could be much more severe. In short, in my view, as a national security guy, this is a serious national security issue. Now, my remarks this afternoon are not about what happened last year. I think you've heard other speakers talk about that, you've read about this, and I frankly think that the forensics on last year's Russian attacks will come fully to light by way of the several investigations that are currently underway. And I think, frankly, we should have confidence that the investigations in the Senate and with the special uh, consul will bring out the facts. But some things are already clear while these investigations are underway. First of all, Russia tried to influence the election outcome in favor of one candidate. And second, at a very minimum, Putin tried to discredit the process. He tried to discredit the election outcome by casting doubt on its legitimacy, on its credibility. So why is this so serious? Uh, why should we act now? I've got essentially five points. Uh, and let me run through these five, and then I hope we have a bit of time for questions. So first of all, this is a serious national security issue because Putin has demonstrated successfully that he can use cyber tools against the U.S. election process. This is not academic theory. This is not hypothetical. It is real. He influenced our election process. He cast doubt on our democracy. And he has gridlocked Washington, D.C. at a very low cost to Russia. Now, in military terms, if you go to the military dictionary, there's actually a 
very clear definition of what constitutes a threat. And what that definition says is that a threat has two components. There must be a capability and there must be intent. So a threat is capability plus intent. And Russia's attack last year meets very clearly that dictionary definition. So this is a proven credible threat. And that's the first reason uh, that we have to take this seriously. Second, this is a national security issue because Russia is not going away. Putin himself can be in office until 2029. 2029. Even when he is replaced someday, any Russian successor leader would likely use similar tactics to inflame Russian nationalism, that is, to cause Russians to rally around the flag, and to weaken international opponents, especially if they could do it at such low cost. Why would Russia do this? What are Putin's objectives? What's he actually up to? I want to get into this in a bit of detail here, so let me spend a couple minutes on this question. What is Putin up to? Very simply, the Russian experts I know and have worked with believe that he has one overriding objective, and that is simply to stay in power atop the Russian state. But he knows that in the long run, he has a very weak hand. Russia is a state in steady decline. Decline economically, it's a single resource economy, oil and gas, it produces nothing else that anybody else wants to buy. It's in decline by way of all health indicators, by way of demographics, by way of all political social indicators. Russia is a state in decline. So in order to stay in control of such a state, Putin centralizes power very narrowly around himself, and he plays to a few key supporters, the Russian military, the intelligence services, and a reasonably small set of Russian oligarchs, the very rich. Meanwhile, he suppresses all internal opposition. He inflames Russian nationalism, Russian pride, the Russian sense of greatness, the Russian sense of being victimized over the last 25 years after the fall of the Soviet Union. If you are Putin and you want to stay in power, you eliminate internal opposition. And if you don't have a real external enemy, you create one. And that is exactly what he has done. This is all to stay in power. Now, beyond staying in power himself, he has other objectives. Not as primary as staying in power, but closely related. He also wants to create a geographic buffer zone around Russian borders. This buffer zone be a friendly or at least weak and compliant countries along Russia's periphery. This is why he invaded Georgia in the Caucasus in 2008 and why he still occupies Georgian territory. This is why he seized the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine in 2014, just three years ago. This is why he continues to this day to destabilize eastern Ukraine by sponsoring proxy militias, providing military support, and so forth. All of this activity on his border, on his periphery, is to destabilize these neighbors so that they will not lean towards the West. They will not lean towards the European Union or towards NATO. Because if Georgia or Ukraine were successful as democracies, integrated into the EU and NATO, that example would be disastrous for Putin. It would be an example to the Russian people that they don't have to live in a state of decline, that there is greater opportunity. If their next door neighbors demonstrate this opportunity, Russia would be at risk. Putin would be at risk. Russians would essentially ask, why not us? And Putin will not tolerate that question. And then finally, Putin has even broader objectives. He would like to take advantage of any opportunity
to crack the solidarity, the cohesion of the West. That is the cohesion of the Atlantic Alliance, NATO, the cohesion of the European Union, and ultimately the cohesion of the United States as a member of NATO and as a partner of the European Union. He wants the sanctions imposed by the European Union and the U.S. to end. These sanctions are an insult to him, and they're further weakening his already weak economy. He will try to divide the West, create cracks, fissures, erode cohesion. That's why he conducts large military exercises on the borders of NATO, while he sort of rattles his military saber, even with nuclear threats. Uh, that's why he supported Marie Le Pen and her party in the French elections uh, just a couple months ago. And that's fundamentally why he tried to interfere with U.S. elections uh, last year. He is very pleased. He is very pleased today that the White House is ensnarled in this controversy, ensnarled by this issue, that Washington is all gridlocked by the controversy that he promoted. If he can weaken the West at low cost, he sees himself as strengthening Russia, and he will do so every single time. So when I say that Russia is not going away, I mean that Russian leaders will continue to centralize power and do what they can to stay in power. They will continue to weaken their next door neighbors, and they will take every opportunity to crack the cohesion of the West. So the Russian threat is real, and it's here to stay, even beyond the person of Vladimir Putin. Now, the third reason that election security here in the States should be a national security issue is because other states are watching. If Russia can attack the U.S. election, then others are saying, so can we. Think here of Iran, North Korea, even non-state actors like the so-called Islamic State, and perhaps others. So others are watching. The fourth reason out of five that this is a national security issue is because our next election, the 2018 off-cycle elections and the 2020 presidential elections, are actually just around the corner. And these will be lucrative targets to any cyber opponent. Time is actually quite short to repair our vulnerabilities. We have to have a sense of urgency now. And that's one of the messages that we're trying to communicate with our partners there at DEF CON this week, this sense of urgency. And finally, fifth and finally, this is a national security issue because other democracies beyond the United States are also vulnerable. Putin tried to vote quote, unquote. He tried to vote in the U.S. elections last fall. He voted in favor of one party in the French elections just a couple months ago. He will likely try to vote in the German elections in several months from now. Earlier, past years, he has voted in Georgia, Ukraine, and Montenegro. So this is a threat to the United States. This is the United States national security issue. But beyond us alone, it's a national security issue because friends and allies are also under threat. So for these five reasons, the security of the U.S. election process is a top national security issue. And that's what brings me to DEF CON this afternoon. Now look, I'm not the expert on securing, on how to secure our voting process. But there are well-established experts in that room with you today and elsewhere around DEF CON, in the community. There are well-established experts on what needs to be done. In particular, I would point to two nonprofit efforts of verified voting uh, and the Center for Internet Security as providing standards and well-thought-out, well-reasoned uh, remedial steps that need to be taken to ensure we never have a repeat of last fall. The good news here 
despite all that sort of bleak outlook. The good news here is that we actually know what needs to be done to secure our 50 states and the over 6,000 voting jurisdictions around the country. One of the challenges, of course, is that we do have so many points of entry, so many potential vulnerabilities. It is now time, however, in my view, to elevate this issue to the level of a national campaign, a national campaign that is bipartisan, or frankly, nonpartisan. Uh, I've served under presidential administrations of both parties. George Bush hired me into his White House in 2007. Barack Obama invited me to stay in 2009. I'm about as bipartisan and nonpartisan as one can be. This campaign needs to have that same feature. This is not about which party was attacked or which party be vulnerable or which benefit. This is about our American election process and the very foundation of our democracy. It is the fundamental link. Just think about this. It is the fundamental link between everyone who lines up on voting day and casts his ballot, his or her ballot, and his role in the democracy and the elected government officials that follow. That fundamental link is under assault. So look, for over 40 years as a military officer, as a government official, I didn't even line up to vote. I voted by absentee ballot from wherever I was stationed around the world. I filled out the ballot, I sealed it, I signed it, and I assumed that when I mailed it, that voting security was somebody else's job. Someone else was going to take care of this. I frankly didn't worry about it. I felt that my ballot, when I posted it in the mail, was secure. After last year's experience, I don't feel that way anymore. I'm convinced that I personally, as a citizen, have to get involved in this, and I am involved in this. And I hope you will come to a similar conclusion and that you will join this effort, either as technical experts committed to finding good remedies and appropriate safeguards, or simply as concerned citizens. Let's get involved and let's get this fixed. Look, I'm happy now to take your questions and I hope that we can actually engineer that with this sort of uh, video connection. So thanks. can hear you, Julia. All right, sorry, Jacqueline. Great, that'll work. Yeah, this is a this is a very fundamental question that was at the centerpiece of my work at NATO beginning 2013. Um, let me take you back a little bit and give you a little context. So NATO came into being in 1949, and the key clause in the treaty that brought those original 12 allies together is Article 5. It's the fifth paragraph, right? And basically it says an attack on one is an attack on all. And the treaty defines an attack, which gets to this question, as an armed attack. And of course, in 1949, four years after the end of World War II, everybody knew what armed attack looked like, right? And that, that definition of armed attack persisted all the way up to 2014. And at a summit with Barack Obama in the chair 
and uh, in the United Kingdom, the then 28 allies updated the Washington Treaty by way of a policy decision. And what they decided and codified was that NATO will treat cyber attacks as capable of triggering Article 5, so being equated to an armed attack. So in a way, they updated the 1949 language. Now, that usually follows by the question, well, what kind of cyber attack? So did the cyber attack uh, on the United States last year, for example, or the cyber attack on Estonia in 2007, Georgia in 2008, or, or Ukraine repeatedly over the last couple of years, do those constitute um, do those trigger Article 5 and therefore a NATO response? NATO left the answer to that question ambiguous and not well defined. And the idea here was that NATO, while it wanted to be on the record of signaling that cyber could trigger the treaty and a response, it wanted to be ambiguous about exactly where that line was to be drawn. And it also wanted to be ambiguous in terms of the nature of NATO's response. So NATO has not taken the decision that cyber attacks will be responded to by cyber responses. Uh, so there's a, there's a little benefit here of ambiguity in the sense of signaling to potential opponents that, first of all, you can't get away with a cyber attack uh, if it generates the kind of impact that an armed attack might have. And that second, um, as an opponent, you should not feel certain about how NATO exactly will respond. First of all, uh, uh, I mean, I take it by the question that you, like me, think that this will be a challenge and that there will be partisan politics um, th that some try to play on this issue. I mean, you have only to look at the other contentious issues in, um, in terms of updating our democracy. Uh, you know, the outline of voting districts, uh, partisan uh, candidate selection. Uh, partisan campaign financing, uh, partisan uh, and, and term limits, very partisan, right? So there are other issues underway. There are other initiatives underway, all of which have drawn partisan fire in terms of the pros and cons, the winners and the losers on those issues. The reason I think there's a shot here for this issue the election of our voting system, to be nonpartisan or bipartisan is because of the National Security Act. It's really only by way of the sorts of assaults that we saw last year that an outside power, a foreign power, can threaten our democracy from inside. All those other issues, districts, candidates, financing, term limits, those are all internal issues. Russia doesn't get to vote on those issues. And our system will deal with those issues. And they will draw partisan pros and cons. This one, though, our voting system security, I think has the potential to rise above that partisanship. And that's why, in my remarks, I emphasize over and over and over again that this is a national security issue. National security typically over the long history of our democracy has been a bipartisan issue. So that's that's my hope. But I take your, it's a very partisan atmosphere.
right. Now, this is another tool in Putin's kit bag, right, in his toolbox. Um, and again, he can do this uh, remotely, uh, sometimes with fingerprints and sometimes not for attribution. Um, he can do it at scale. It's relatively inexpensive. Uh, and he can use especially modern social media platforms uh, to amplify these messages. I mean, if you think back to the time that, you know, sort of the, the media post-war, post-World War II period, 1950s and 60s, you know, Russia at that time, Russian leaders at that time tried to influence Western election campaigns, but they had to do it with, you know, communist parties and those countries and posters and pamphlets and flyers and so forth, right? Well, consider the difference today where bots and social media and fake news uh, and disinformation, misinformation gets flooded onto our airways. So this is a big challenge as well. Um, and, and I don't list this uh, as the same national security level challenge as voting security. But there's no question that there is a Russian attempt to influence the politics outside Russia by way of this mass uh, misinformation campaigning. So for me, and this is as much a personal judgment as anything else, I still have confidence in the American public's ability to discriminate, distinguish between real news and fake news, and to be a pretty sophisticated consumer of news. Um, I think that arena right now is flooded with misinformation and and disinformation and I think social media platforms amplify that so it's it's a challenge and I think it's more difficult today to get the facts because there are so many contrary facts or competing facts quote unquote if you will uh, in opposition but fundamentally I believe that Americans can distinguish I hope I'm right on that the reason I separate that challenge from the voting security challenge is because if the voting process, if the security of the voting process is believed to be sacrificed, jeopardized, uh, compromised, then what I'm concerned about is that Americans could draw the conclusion that their vote no longer counts. and then draw implications. It's not worth going to the polls. It's not worth bothering. It's not worth paying attention to election campaigns. Um, and, and if that link between the voter and his or her elected officials is broken, I'm not sure how you repair it. So, so to me, there is a line that's crossed. If the credibility of our election process is compromised. So for me, it's a different, it's a different character, and I think more severe.
Right. So look, um, like most things in life, uh, the track record here is not clean cut. Uh, and I'm not suggesting by way of my rather pointed and maybe even passionate remarks about what happened to us. I'm not suggesting that our track record is clean as you go back into history. Um, what I am suggesting is that this assault last year is the first serious assault at the heart of our election process. And because we have another election in 18 months, and one after that in 2020, but we don't have much time to do the forensics on this and to review the history before we actually take the practical steps required to repair the vulnerabilities. So I, look, I, I'm a reader of history as well. There are things in our history that all Americans should take a moment to think about. Uh, and look, this country's not perfect. We've made mistakes in the past, but this would be a mistake of huge historic proportions if we imagine this threat away and we run the gamble, we run the risk that the next ele national election is so corrupted that we break the confidence of the American people in the full progress process of democracy. That's what's at risk here. And I don't think the U.S. process has been at such a risk ever in the over 200 years of American voting, um, the voting uh, record. Uh, and if you're asking me for a personal view, I'm no longer in the government. If you're asking me for a personal view, I think it's wrong uh, for any outside power to try to manipulate or delegitimize another's internal electoral process. Well, the, to the extent that we can uh, attribute the the leader, the specific individuals or organizations within the Russian government that are responsible for last year's activities against us, then those should be included, and, and some of those are included in the current sanctions regime. But if this situation becomes more clear and we can further attribute, then obviously those organizations or individuals should be added. Meanwhile, what else can we do? Well, first of all, we should do exactly what we've been talking about for the last, last hour here. We should become a much harder target. Uh, right now, uh, in, look, classic military terms, we're a soft target. The American election system is a soft target. Why? Because we're still operating voting machines connected to the Internet. We're still in some jurisdictions. Uh, conducting elections without the ability to uh, audit them by way of a paper audit trail. Uh, we still have voter registry databases hanging on the Internet, and everybody there obviously knows how vulnerable those databases are. So what happens when um, we just talk about this for the next 18 months or 36 months, and then it happens again? And, and so I think much of what we've talked about, and I think what the voting, the voting, as I recall, the voting village, I think it's called. Sorry, I'm not in voting village. Uh, what that's all about is simply to take this thing seriously, this threat seriously. So we obviously should do that. And then the other thing we should do is, as much as possible, share our experience from last year with like-minded democracies and have an open conversation not only among ourselves, and sharing information among the 50 states, uh, among the secretaries of state, the, typically the senior voting officials in every one of our 50 states, but also down to the individual jurisdictions. So we have to do that sharing internally. But we should share information 
externally, internationally as well. So, for example, a, a good example of this is that the U.S. intelligence community, uh, when it reached its conclusion last fall, after the Russian activities, came to NATO headquarters and briefed all 27 other allies on our experience in classified setting, uh, down to the who, the what, the when, and the where of the Russian activity. That's a good example of the kind of sharing that we should have among our, especially our European allies, especially among our other democratic partners around the world. Because as I mentioned in my, in my remarks, we have a responsibility to fix us. We have, a, we have an at-home responsibility. But we also, as a leading democracy, have a responsibility beyond that, to be the standard bearers for other democracies, many of which are not as wealthy, not as well off, uh, and not as historically grounded as ours. So there's a big responsibility here to get this right for us, but to get it right as the standard bearers for democracies around the world. Right. So, uh, again, I'm not the technical expert here, and I'm sure there may be others in the room, perhaps the representatives of the Department of Homeland Security, who ultimately has federal responsibility to assist the states and local authorities. Uh, and this assistance can come in a number of forms. I mean, first of all, it can come by way of funding assistance. And for a relatively modest amount of federal funding, we could do away with these vulnerable uh, electronic machines, a modest funding. For modest funding from the federal government, we could mandate or make possible uh, a paper audit trail for every election, which assures us that the outcome is credible and, um, and um, responsible. Uh, we should, and DHS, Homeland Security, has taken a decision that among other critical infrastructure systems around the country, so nuclear power plants, electrical power grids, our financial infrastructure, there's a whole set of, there's a whole set of critical infrastructure, that our voting systems are among those. That's a good step. And what that means is that federal funding is available to help state and local jurisdiction voting officials. Uh, a big thing that could be done here, and here I think the Center for Internet Security is is a very credible voice, uh, is to share information on tactics, techniques, procedures, and threats that the even the smallest voting district uh, in all 50 of the states are subject to. So there's a combination of setting standards, uh, sharing information, providing funding, all of which fall directly into the basket of uh, DHS. So uh, I think there are probably some DHS officials there who would, uh, who would agree. Now, my understanding of the experience last fall, or last year, during our election cycle, is that DHS, the federal government, in some instances offered assistance only to be turned down by state and local authority. Uh, so I think this is a two-way street. <laughs> this, is, this is, on the one hand, the potential of the federal government to help, but it's also, and this is what's so important about organizations like DEF CON, uh, it's so important that the local authorities who are not paying as close attention to this and may not be as connected to the and aware of the vulnerabilities of the Internet and voting systems riding along the Internet, that those, system, that those players below the federal level become more aware and be open and welcoming to federal support. So this has got to be a two-way street. And, and by the way, that goes back to the fundamental point that this campaign needs to be national and it needs to be bipartisan.
we need to do this as Americans for America. And that's probably a good point on which to end.